Good morning and welcome to the Northern Institute's People, Policy and Place seminar series. My name is Ruth Wallace and I am the Dean of the College of Indigenous Futures, Education at the Arts at Charles Darwin University and also the Director of our Northern Institute. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands in which we meet today. For us, it is the Larrakia people of Darwin. We always pay respects to Larrakia elders past, present and emerging and further extend that, to res that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining today and the custodians of the lands on which you are placed today. This week, to acknowledge Refugee Week, the Northern Institute is hosting two research seminars, today and Thursday, to raise community awareness of the issues affecting refugees and the refugees' experience. This morning, we have the Professor at Law at the University of Dhaka and Northern Institute Research Fellow, Dr. Ribwinal Hoke, presenting. As a leading comparative constitutional law sco scholar with a focus on Southeast Asia, Professor Hoke can speak the language of the Rohingya and was engaged in protection activities in Rohingya refugee camps in Cox Bazar, Bangladesh. Today, Dr. Hoke will focus on the challenges of protecting the Rohingya refugees, mostly covering the situation in Bangladesh, as well as reflecting on why Australia should take the case of Rohingya protection more seriously. The Rohingya, displaced from Myanmar since 1982, have been living as stateless people, asylum seekers or refugees in many countries, including India, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand and Australia. And many of us may have them as friends or neighbours, so we're very interested in the words of Dr Hoke. If you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen and Ribbonol will address them after his presentation. I'll now hand over to Ribbonol. Thank you. Very good morning to uh, all and welcome to today's seminar to commemorate the Refugee Week 2021 on behalf of the Northern State of Charles Darwin University. Let me begin by thanking Ruth Wallace, the Dean of the, uh, of, of the College and the Director of the Northern Institute. Uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll directly uh, begin the conversation. So uh, let me take a minute to share the screen. Uh, well, here we go. So today I'm going to speak on this particular topic, the challenge of protecting the Rohingya refugees. Uh, a bit of a plan, so these are the issues that I'll be covering in 30 to 35 minutes uh, discussion. So an introduction to the issue, then the introduction about the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh and elsewhere in the world. Then the challenge of protection. So what are the challenges that the global community, as well as Bangladesh, as the leading host state uh, are facing uh, in terms of the protection of the Rohingya refugees. Then I'll move on to why Australia should do more uh, than the business as usual case. Then I'll draw some tentative conclusions. So, well, the Rohingya is an ethnic religious minority Muslim community living since at least the 13th century in the Myanmar Rakhine state, which is bordering with Bangladesh. According to a census in the 19, early, early 1970s, there were 3.6 million Rohingya people. Myanmar has long denied them as citizens. Immediately after Myanmar independence in 1948, and more prominently after 1982 Citizenship Act. And, 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 and this is called the legal denial, as well as there are factual denials. Uh, however, scholars suggest that despite the 1982 Citizenship Act, the Rohingya in Myanmar are the citizens of Myanmar. So the denial is actually de facto, de jure, or according to law, they remain and continue to be the citizens of Myanmar. Despite all these arguments, the reality is that the Rohingya they are stateless refugees in desperate need of protection. And they live in many, many countries in the world. And 
Rohingya community form one of the five largest refugee groups, according to a recent United Nations statistics or report. Uh, and it comes on the fifth in the list of five, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar. And interestingly, only these five countries share the or produce 67% of 26.4 million Rohingya refugees. The creation of the Rohingya humanitarian crisis that has become a dangerous turn in 2017, I'll come to that in a while, uh, is because of the state actions in Myanmar or the state crimes, along with super nationalist Buddhists. So I'm not judgmental on this. There is a fantastic study, a book indeed, uh, which is by Francis Wade in 2017. And the title of the book says it all, The Myanmar's Enemy Within, Buddhist Violence and the Making of a Muslim Other. So the state and the, and the majority Buddhist people went hand in hand to create an othering nation, the Rohingya people. And uh, about the hosting of the Rohingya refugees or Rohingya people, there are many countries, as I have already said, but it's interesting that Bangladesh stands as number one country as a host to host Rohingya refugees. So over a million in Bangladesh and it's more than the Rohingya people left behind in Myanmar. Uh, which is 0.85 uh, million. Then comes Saudi Arabia, then comes Pakistan, then Malaysia, then India and United Arab Emirates, 50,000 each. Then Thailand, then Australia, then USA, which are reported to share Rohingya refugees, 5,000 each in each country. So, in the picture, we see, uh, so it's, an speaking, it's a speaking picture. It tells you the, the story, the suffering, the untold, uh, I mean, un, uh, very pressing story, uh, pathetic. The making of the Rohingya refugee crisis, the current crisis, 2017. So in the picture, we see uh, many people on, sh on, on shallow boat, or on, on, on banana plants, I mean, floating uh, in the river, just nearing a village in Bangladesh. Uh, then uh, a little bit about the history of the current influx into Bangladesh uh, that began in August 2017, following a, an, an unprecedented uh, brutality by Myanmar's uh, military on the Rohingya refugee, on the Rohingya people. Indeed, violence or the state crimes and the persecution have made them flee in the past. As for Bangladesh, for example, the year was 1978 when we, uh, we saw first small scale influx of Rohingya people. Then the saga was repeated in 1991, 1992, 2013 and 15 and uh, many more times on a scale, small scale in between. And uh, about the 2017 uh, brutalities and the resulting uh, population displacement and, or, 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 or criminal deportation of the Rohingya people into Bangladesh, uh, a United Nations fact-finding mission just simply termed it as genocide, as a genocide, or a textbook example of genocide and indeed um, I, have, I have had the chance of talking to the Rohingya refugees visiting the camps in which they are currently living so I have heard horrible stories of killings torture rape arson and forced labor and these are the things that are documented in many many reports uh, videos and films and 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 the uh, uh, oral histories by the victims themselves. And the documents are already placed before the international forums, including international courts. Then, uh, immediately after 2017 August, 
uh, the, the talks about the repatriation of the Rohingya to Myanmar began. However, despite the repatriation of earlier refugees that came to Bangladesh uh, from 1978 down to 2016, currently over a million refugees now live in the world's largest camp in Cox's Bajar, a district bordering with Myanmar's Rakhine state. And I am from Cox's Baja. That is why I can speak the Rohingya language and I understand the Rohingya language. So the Rohingya people indeed share the same social tradition and the language. The local dialect is different from Bangla or Bengali, but it's the local dialect that's spoken by the people in Cox's Baja. So, uh, so let's have a look at this picture. This is a tiny, tiny part of a mass of camps, shabby camps erected overnight and within one week, within two weeks maximum, uh, within, within two months maximum uh, in Bangladesh's Cox's Bajar district. So here, down the picture, uh, this is a small shop. I mean, a small shop run by the Rohingya people. So it's similar to the huts in which they live. And uh, uh, let me talk about uh, the conditions and, 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 and the factual situations of the Rohingya people in Bangladesh. Uh, first of all, Bangladesh itself is a very tiny, small country with a huge population of, uh, 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 population of 170 million. Now, Around 1,200 people live in Bangladesh per square kilometer, and it's one of the most densely populated countries in the world. So Bangladesh has many problems. Despite the, I mean, despite the fact that it has also made a major economic progression or development in recent times. However, Bangladesh showed a rare example of humanitarianism by sheltering a huge population that we call today Rohingya refugees. But ironically, Bangladesh does not recognize the Rohingya people as refugees. There are reasons. One major reason is that Bangladesh is not a party to the International Refugee Convention or its protocol. And another reason is that Bangladesh fears that even despite the convention or beyond the convention if Bangladesh recognizes them as refugees officially there might be more burden on Bangladesh so out of these fears and practical reasons uh, Bangladesh does not recognize Rohingya people as refugees however is the government of Bangladesh that is taking the lion part of the burden to assist the Rohingya refugee people uh, in, in, in their daily lives. So, along with other international community members, states, or, I mean, international organizations, including international NGOs, uh, Bangladesh is working to provide them health facilities, shelter, education, to whatever extent, not formal education, uh, education for children in the camps, and also uh, has facilitated some small businesses uh, run by and owned by Rohingya refugees in the camp area. A major problem uh, that remains from day one to today with regard to the uh, security of the Rohingya people themselves is their vulnerability uh, to human trafficking and migrant smuggling. Many, many people have already died and wrote to Malaysia or Indonesia, and there is a clandestine movement of Rohingya refugee people um, through the sea voyages. Then, uh, very recently, uh, because of this problem, as well as the problem of drugs, alcohols, and arms, and out of a fear that uh, the Rohingya people might start insurgency or a security threat to Bangladesh, Bangladesh has uh, started relocating some 200,000 Rohingya people to a remote island, uh, which is a controversial move. 
recently the United Nations officials visited the uh, new home uh, we call the remote island in Bashancho, uh, and there were protests by the people who are already trans transferred to that remote island. However, there's a report that they are kind of happy seeing, seeing the arrangements and the facilities in the new home of the Rohingya people. Let me have a, a look, uh, let me show you a picture of the new home here. So this is the uh, new home built for around uh, 200,000 Rohingya people. And as I said, uh, this is still controversial because uh, it's in a remote island and uh, people are, uh, are, 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 are fearful that it would be no more than a prison. And here, uh, in April 20, 20, 2021, a woman is sitting in front of his lost home the homes that we have seen before. There was a massive fire, and this is nothing new. There had been many instances of fire, and there are allegations that these fires are pre-calculated. I mean, they are engineered, doctored, not natural disaster. So the one uh, objection was that uh, this was made to happen to compel the Rohingya refugees to move to the new home in Bashan, which is this. Now, uh, the point uh, of the challenge of protection towards the Rohingya refugee people, uh, in first of all, in Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is no doubt playing the key role in providing assistance to refugees. And however, it doesn't have any domestic refugee regime or a fully grown policy to render assistance to the Rohingya refugee refugees. And it has, as I have already mentioned, the problem of resources, problem of resources, because it's a huge number of people, around 1.2 million altogether. And uh, continue with this. The, Talks about the repatriation of Rohingyas to Myanmar started early in 2018, but those uh, talks have failed. There are international political factors and geopolitics. For example, uh, both China and India shy away from assisting Bangladesh. And the Indian Prime Minister, immediately after the 2017 Rohingya influx, flew to Myanmar and uh, promised Myanmar with assistance. I, uh, and we are, we do not know what kind of assistance Mr. Narendra Modi offered to Myanmar. On the other hand, the big global powers are not robust enough. For example, United States, uh, is not playing a robust role here. And recently we all know that Myanmar government, Aung San Suu Kyi's government has been overtaken by a military junta in a coup in February 21. And before this, immediately before this, just two months before this, or one month before this uh, military power taking over, uh, there was a tripartite dialogue which created a ray of hope for the repatriation of Myanmar refugees. And the tripartite dialogue was amongst China, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. So the China uh, came forward to offer its leadership, but that didn't uh, translate into reality. Then with the military takeover, today the repatriation is put in abeyance. Then the shadow government established by the ousted government leaders in Myanmar uh, has promised the Rohingya the citizenship status. This is interesting because the leader of this government, Aung San Suu Kyi, clearly uh, denied the Rohingya refugees as citizens. And she vehemently protested international courts jurisdictions uh, against Myanmar. We have seen that. Now, uh, moving on to the global protection challenges. So there's no doubt that the Rohingya people has have have recently faced genocide, which is a major crime 
Along with genocide, there is a crime of forcible mass deportation or criminal deportation under the International Criminal Law or the Statute of the International Criminal Court. Uh, yet the Security Council has failed to take any concrete step. And the United Nations General Assembly has also failed equally. However, we know that to cover, or to deal with this type of situations of humanitarian crisis, as well as gross violation of human rights or genocide or ethnic cleansing in which United Nations Security Council fails, uh, there are some resolutions, at least two famous resolutions by United Nations General Assembly, according to which the General Assembly can take action, collective measures. One is the responsibility to protect, which is in 2005, I'll come to that later. The other is the Uniting for Peace Resolution, 1950. That's the first one. Uh, let, let me say a little bit about the uh, 2005 resolution on the right to protect, R2P. This resolution, this doctrine, gives primacy to the protection of people who are subjected to gross violation of human rights over the protection of the territorial integrity of the state concern. So according to this doctrine, we all states have an obligation to protect the Rohingya people vis-a-vis -vis the claim of sovereignty by Myanmar. So even military intervention can be, can be possible, can be made possible under this resolution. On the other hand, uh, this is also important. R2P makes it a duty of all nations to come forward to protect a population, particularly when there's a grave crime uh, against humanity, which is, the exact, which is exactly the case for the Rohingya people. However, we know that uh, despite the failure, there, were, there are certain global measures that are going on. We all know that, for example, uh, United Nations resolutions and, uh, and, 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 and different fact-finding missions and uh, United Nations Human Rights Council resolutions. While these actions are going on, reports, visits, facts finding, very important, significant measures. Uh, we also have some actions before the international court. So, so far, two actions, one before the international criminal court, and the other is before international court of justice. Most uh, striking or interesting is the, is the case before international criminal court under the ICC statute. Uh, Myanmar is not a party uh, to the ICC statute. On the other hand, Bangladesh is a party to the ICC statute. And uh, in this background, in this situation, it's not any state, but rather the prosecutor of the ICC, International Criminal Court, initiated a measure in the, in the court to, to seek permission for the investigation of genocide or other brutalities against Myanmar. And on 6 September, because of that petition by the prosecutor, uh, 6 September 2018, the ICC pre-trial chamber ruled that uh, although Myanmar was not a party to the ICC, the court can proceed against Myanmar because one of the elements of the crime of deportation actually was was uh, was uh, in the territory of Bangladesh, which was a party to the ICC statute. And because of that, as a follow-up, on 14 November 2019, the ICC approved a full investigation into Myanmar's alleged crimes against the Rohingya or crimes against humanity. This full investigation has just begun uh, and continued. And then, Interestingly enough, uh, there, at the same time, uh, there was a petition, a, a, a proceeding before the International Court of Justice, the global court of the world community. Uh, and this was by Gambia. So it's a, it's a third state. This is interesting. Neither by Bangladesh nor by any neighboring countries of Myanmar. And after a hearing, the court uh, ICJ issued 
unprecedentedly a unanimous decision on the provisional measure. This is unprecedented because of two things. One is the petitioner, who, which, uh, which is Gambia, is a third party petitioner. And the other thing is in all provisional measures or injunction measures before from the International Court of Justice, there were some dissents, but this time this was a unanimous decision. This is interesting. Then because of this proceeding, Myanmar has got time to submit counter memorial, I mean responses uh, to the case. This is a live case still ongoing, uh, but the court issued provisional major asking Myanmar not to repeat the activities that have been alleged. However, Myanmar got a time until 23rd, 3rd of July 2021, which is next month. And we believe that Myanmar will fail the date. And uh, also interestingly, the Maldives, Canada, and Netherlands have showed their interest to intervene in this case or to become interveners. So this is a clearly good sign of uh, goodwill uh, or, or readiness to help the Rohingya refugees uh, on the part of the international uh, community. Uh, but the limitations uh, are there from uh, about the international court actions uh, because uh, the jurisdictions are mostly consensus based. So since Myanmar is either not a party or Myanmar is not cooperating with the international courts, uh, so there will be there will be problems in the in the implementation of the of the court rulings if there are any uh, in the future. Uh, United Nations Security Council is in charge of implementing the court orders, and we know the politics within the United Nations Security Council. So, uh, nevertheless, this is an important catalyst that, that uh, I'll argue uh, that it creates pressure on Myanmar as well as other international states to cooperate amongst themselves to solve this crisis. Now, uh, let me turn to uh, to why Australia needs to take the Rohingya protection more seriously. So there are conflicting statistics about the number of Rohingya people living in Australia. According, according to one statement is 5,000 and according to another account is 3,000. However, Australia is a significant member of the global community and we all know that it's a democracy. Uh, so it has constitutional values, democratic values uh, towards the protection of the refugees, any kind of refugees. However, Australia has also a decreasing reputation for refugee protection. And from Northern Institute uh, for, for this Refugee Week, the second uh, seminar webinar will focus on this. Uh, we have people detained in Darwin uh, who are refugees uh, and detained over a longer period of time. And uh, Australia has a duty under different international instruments, international law, as well as on the right to protect resolution of the United Nations, to protect the Rohingya, not just those who are already in Australia, to protect the Rohingya overall. And uh, as I have said, so we have around three to 5,000 Rohingya people in Australia, and around 50 members are in Darwin. I have Talk to many of uh, Rohingya people, uh, several Rohingya people uh, who live in Darwin. Uh, Rohingya refugees are victims of human trafficking and smuggling, and they choose Australia as their ultimate destination. For example, if we take Bangladesh as the source country for their movement, they travel uh, by sea to Malaysia or Indonesia or to Thailand and ultimately from Indonesia to uh, Darwin or from Malaysia to Darwin. And therefore, Australia needs to do something more to prevent this clandestine movement uh, from the source states rather than simply detaining people, uh, Rohingya refugees found at the borders of Australia. So uh, there are many ways to do that. Actually. A former Australian Human Rights Commissioner, Mr. Chris, said that international community can do more to hold, hold the Myanmar military to account 
and one means of holding them to account is by prosecuting in domestic courts under the international principle universal principle of uh, universal principle of universal jurisdiction and uh, importantly australia is a party to the icc statute and it has enacted a domestic law to implement that international criminal law into australian domestic law so it can provide uh, I, I mean it can initiate at least an attempt to domestically uh, prosecute the people responsible for rohingya genocide or brutalities so uh, australia should also protect and free the rohingya refugees it has detained on offshore detention centers in Nauru or on the Manus Island. We all know that. Uh, let me now conclude uh, my, 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 my discussion, and these are tentative conclusions. Uh, Bangladesh has responsibility to protect the Rohingya refugees which are within its territory, but uh, we should acknowledge that it has limitations too. Uh, despite the limitations, Bangladesh has shared a major burden. And now, other third countries should come forward to take the burden uh, of uh, providing assistance to the Rohingya refugees, not all, those not only in Bangladesh, but also those who are in other countries, as well as those who are in Myanmar. The wheels of international justice have turned quite slowly. The mechanisms are in process, but they are noticeably slow. With the change of the current, uh, with the government uh, uh, in Myanmar to a military ruler, the challenge of protecting the Rohingya refugees has become even more complex. It, it has turned out to be a daunting task now. Uh, the political instability and the geopolitics within the United Nations system particularly within United Nations Security Council, have retarded uh, serious strong actions against Myanmar, which is, uh, I mean, I mean, failing the Rohingya refugees. So, all international community members now need to increase their efforts to protect the Rohingya at the international level, at the source level, I mean, in Myanmar. And the current crisis is a living crisis. Crisis. So, unless we take a good care of the situation, Myanmar will continue to produce more refugees, more stateless people, and more irregular or undocumented migrants who will end up in, 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 in deaths uh, while en route to different destinations. And Myanmar is bordering with five countries. If I'm not wrong, I might be factually wrong here, but uh, bear with me if I'm wrong. Wrong. But uh, China, Bangladesh, India, Thailand, and Laos are the five countries uh, bordering share sharing borders with Myanmar. Along with them, Japan, Japan must come forward, play uh, an active role. So because Japan is an economic figure and uh, it has got economic interest with Myanmar and all other countries that I have mentioned, uh, except China. China is the major player here. Then the organization ASEAN, of which Myanmar is a member, should play a more active role. So far, it has also failed us. It has also failed the Rohingya refugees, like the United Nations Security Council. And from the law perspective, since uh, uh, I, 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 I'm a student of law and uh, I have some, sometimes uh, tried to see the Rohingya refugee problem from the legal lenses. Uh, so let me tell you this from the law perspective. Refugee Convention has shown resilience, its utility over the years. Uh, as such, even the states uh, which are not party to the refugee, parties to the Refugee Convention have obligations under other international instruments, including uh, different United Nations resolutions. Then, uh, from the law perspective too, the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction, I mean the ruling that it has jurisdiction, it can exercise jurisdiction against Myanmar, 
is a landmark development. And this is for the first time in the history of uh, international court jurisprudence that uh, a non-member state has been brought to uh, accountability through a litigation. In the same way, International Court of Justice invocation by a third state, Gambia, is also historic. These actions simply need to be translated into a meaningful change of the uh, status quo that we are now experiencing. So thank you so very much. Um, uh, this is an acknowledgement page, and I have relied on Demo development and cooperation, a German magazine, in which uh, I've written several uh, small contributions on the Rohingya refugee protection, and the pictures are taken from that. And also, I have relied on ICC, Amicus Brief, uh, uh, that has been submitted to the ICC on behalf of Bangladeshi civil society organizations and activists, um, of which I was a part uh, uh, in, in drafting the ICC brief. So I relied on this too. Thank you so very much for your patient hearing, and thank you to Northern State Youth for organizing this um, uh, significant seminar in commemoration of that future. Thank you. Thank you for presenting today and everyone for joining us. We actually have do have a couple of questions um, for you, if you don't mind. Okay, so the first question is from Ashraful, and it was, how would you assess the viability of R2P as a measure against Myanmar, given the history of foreign military interventions in other countries, such as Libya, Iraq and Afghanistan, which further increased the political crises? Thank you, thank you, Ashraful, for your question. Um, uh, for the information of all of us, Ashraful is also an insider into this area. He's from Bangladesh and uh, he's a researcher, PhD uh, candidate at the University of New South Wales on this issue. Uh, this is a very vital question. No doubt about that, it has got some limitations, R2P. And uh, yes, if uh, if, if applied the doctrine uh, in an unprincipled way or in a non-consensus way, then there might be uh, more serious uh, problems than uh, the doctrine uh, seeks to resolve. Uh, uh, to be honest, there are uh, there there is actually no or there are little uh, instances of of applying the doctrine of R2P, although there are. Uh, uh, successful uh, instances of applying the Uniting for Peace Resolution. And uh, yes, in, in, in Libya, uh, we, we can see that, yeah. So yeah, th there's a danger, but uh, it all depends on how we formulate, uh, how we organize the international community. Uh, so depending on the consensus and the political will of the major players in the global politics, it can be successfully used. And there are some signs that the RTP can be used. Thank you. And there was also another question um, from Ashraful as well. Do you think ICC and ICJ can actually reach a judgment against the perpetrators in Myanmar? Uh, the, the, the courts um, are ready, it seems, and uh, but the practicality uh, is that, I mean, uh, Myanmar will not cooperate uh, uh, with, with the ICC ruling or ICJ ruling, uh, it seems. But uh, their jurisdiction is basically against the states, not individual persons. However, the military officials, they are not individual people. They're the part of the state. And just prudentially, there's no problem in, 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 in issuing proceedings against or even arrest warrants uh, against the military, responsible military officials uh, in Myanmar. Uh, but uh, as I've uh, mentioned during my uh, discussion is the problem about the implementation of the international court rulings. So uh, we cannot independently, independently implement the international Court ruling, unless the recalcitrant state cooperates. I mean, say for example, Myanmar produces their generals 
uh, to the international community uh, or the United Nations Security Council comes forward to implement the judgment of ruling. And according to United Nations Charter, the responsible organ to implement the court ruling is the United Nations Security Council, which can uh, enforce the judgment militarily by using force if needed. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the questions we actually have for today. But if anyone else wants to, uh, or if anyone wants to contact uh, Ridwanor, I've actually put his email address, his contact email address in the chat there. And um, you can view his research profile on the Northern Institute website if you want to read a bit more. So Ridwanor, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us today and being part of our seminar series. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you for uh, helping us recognise and acknowledge Refugee Week. And thank you all for coming and joining us. Thank you.